All right, welcome everybody to um, our discussion panel on open education degrees. This is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium for OER, and I'm pleased to be here with six experts um, in the open education and OER degree area. Um, I wanted to uh, give you a little bit of context for why we're having this panel at the beginning of the uh, semester uh, during a very busy time for folks, as we know. Um, not only, of course, is this a really exciting emerging area um, at, at our community colleges, um, but um, the Year of Open uh, celebration, the August theme was on open education degrees. And we had over 10 folks contribute open perspectives on that. Um, that are our same topic here uh, that uh, we had Richard Sebastian from Achieving the Dream uh, who runs the OER um, initiative OER degree initiative there we had a number of colleges who are participating in that uh, submit uh, perspectives um, we also had the California ZTZ uh, program which is the zero textbook cost degree program contribute perspectives um, of course, we had we had Tidewater, who many of you know, one of the leaders in that area, uh, who did the first Z degree. And so um, we also had um, some folks who were outside the community college. We had Thomas Edison University and Open Kaplan. So when you get a chance, uh, do check out those perspectives on Year of Open. And um, today we have some, some new perspectives to share with you as well. Um, as many of you know, the Community College Consortium for OER is a community of practice for open education. Um, we, we work with um, colleges throughout the country um, and in Canada. Um, our most recent members are Mercer Community College from New Jersey and Frontier College from Colorado. And those are our first colleges in those states. So we're very excited to have them join us um, in uh, the consortium. Uh, we have webinars uh, throughout uh, the academic year. Um, you can go to our website at any time and find out uh, about those. They are free and open to um, our education community. I wanted to mention a couple of other activities that are coming up in the next month um, related to OER and OER degrees. Next Wednesday, um, there will be a Twitter chat on open education degrees. So I know we're going to be answering a lot of questions today, but uh, this discussion can continue uh, next Wednesday um, on Twitter uh, using the Eden chat hashtag. We have two webinars coming up in September uh, 13th and 27th. And um, on starting an OER initiative, institution so we'll have two folks who are two colleges who are relatively recent um, to the um, OER world uh, sharing how they got their initiative started and then September 27th will be a focus on faculty and librarians selecting OER together so I hope that you can come to those as well now I want to uh, give my panelists a chance to introduce themselves and then we will get going on um, the actual panel discussion and uh, Quill, I'll have you go, I'll have you start if you may, um, and a quick quick introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Quill West, and I am the Open Education Project Manager at Pierce College in um, the Tacoma area of Washington State. I have been working in um, on an open education degree in one way or another for the last five years. Um, and um, I'm excited to be here to talk with all of you today. And I forgot to mention that I'm also the um, leadership president of CCC OER. Yes, absolutely. Um, and just briefly, um, as we get started, because part of my job here is to remind everybody of things. If you have not clicked on the mute button on your microphone, please take a moment to do that. Look for the icon of a microphone in your Zoom window. Yes, thank you, Quill. I'm going to mute everyone and then let my panelists unmute themselves. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. All right, Kim, you're up next. Could you please introduce yourself? Sure. This is Kim Thanos. I'm one of the founders and the CEO of Lunum Learning. 
uh, we have been working with institutions around the country on OER degree programs for about the same time frame as Quill. Probably all of this started about five years ago, just over five years ago. Uh, we are providing technical support for the um, eight, Achieving the Dream grantees in their degree programs and probably working with about 30 or 40 other institutions around the country that are really pursuing a full OER degree program. So I uh, look forward to, forward to hearing about the experiences of everyone and sharing some of what we've seen through that. Thank you, Kim. We're really thrilled that you could join us. I know that um, <laughs> it's a hard squeeze sometimes, um, so really appreciate that. And Amanda Coolidge, who is joining us from her vacation at Prince Edward Island. <laughs> Tell us about your work up in Hi. British Columbia. Sure. So my name is Amanda Coolidge. I'm senior manager of open education with BC campus. And um, I, our office is located in Victoria, British Columbia, but also uh, in Vancouver, British Columbia. And our role um, as an organization is to work with all of the public post-secondary institutions, so colleges and universities across British Columbia, to work in the areas of um, educational technology, professional learning, um, and open education, and as well as on some collaborative projects with other government groups within our province. So when, within the Open Education Group, we um, have a open textbook project that started in 2012. And uh, just recently, this in the last six months, last four months, we've announced that uh, three of our colleges um, and universities will be starting Z creds, which is our version of Z Z degrees. Um, so I'm excited to talk about that later today. Thank you, Amanda. And it's, it's great to have Amanda in many ways here, but also really speaking from a perspective of being involved in um, the idea of a Z degree or Z cred only for the last six months or so um, gives a different perspective from those who've been doing it for four or five years. So thank you. Um, and I'm going around in a circle here. So next up, James glapa Grosclang. I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, hey everybody, thanks Una. Uh, James uh, Galapagos-Glag with College of the Canyons in, uh, usually I say sunny Southern California. Today I'm going to say really hot Southern California. It's 110 degrees Fahrenheit or 42 degrees Celsius uh, here today. Um, at College of the Canyons, we're working on uh, OER in, in, in many different ways, including uh, two uh, pathways. One is a Career Technical Education Certificate in Water Systems Technology. So we're really, really happy to, to be working on a, a CTE pathway. Uh, also, we're, we're uh, finishing up a uh, uh, transfer degree in sociology, which again will be all open or all OER, it is all OER. Uh, that's, that's one part of what I do. Another part of what I am very happy to do is to uh, serve as a technical assistance provider for a statewide uh, zero textbook cost grant program here in uh, the California Community Colleges and the California Community Colleges we have 114 colleges serving uh, well over 2 million people so uh, there's a great potential for impact there so looking forward to chatting with you. All right thank you James and uh, next up uh, Preston Davis from Nova. Yes uh, good afternoon or maybe morning depending on where you are. Uh, I am Preston Davis, Director of Instructional Services at Northern Virginia Community College. I uh, have been involved in OER uh, pathways for five years or so. Uh, currently have two uh, programs in place and are developing a third uh, pathway uh, built on uh, open resources uh, for our students here at NOVA. Um, and uh, in addition to that, I'm you know, involved as one of the vice presidents for uh, the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources. And I'm glad that you all are here and we've got a good number of folks who are really interested in uh, OER and Open Pathways. And I hope that you find the, this uh, very informative. Thank you. Thank you, Preston. And, and Preston is, was one of the pioneers in this who started a program back in 2013. So um, we're really pleased to have you, Preston. And TJ, TJ Bliss um, from Wiki Education, uh, welcome and tell us a little bit about your background. Hi everyone. Yeah, so I am at Wiki Education, which is a nonprofit uh, located in the Bay Area. But the reason I'm on this panel is because for the last three years, I was the program officer at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation 
uh, responsible for open educational resources and uh, was able to provide a, a lot of funding toward OER degrees, um, the, including the grant to Achieving the Dream, and, and worked with many of the people on this call uh, who were involved in, in legislation in California. And so I've been involved in the, uh, the I idea of OER degrees for a while and have been watching it from a 30,000 foot uh, vantage point across the nation and, and actually throughout the world. There are people working on OER and open education degrees uh, on a global scale that may not actually be represented on this call um, out of New Zealand. And uh, so I have kind of have a global perspective on what's going on as well as a, a, you know, a North American perspective. And so I'm excited to hear what people have to say and to weigh in where I can. Thank you, TJ. We're pleased you could make it as well. Um, so I want to just uh, give you a little bit of the logistics. For those of you who normally attend our webinars, you know, um, we, usually operate a little bit differently and we're hoping that this works and that you'll be patient with us. Um, we have a set of questions um, that we put together around open education degrees and each of our panelists um, has ownership of one of those questions and they're going to uh, read the question and it, I have a slide for it and they will answer it. Um, other panelists will be invited to uh, respond and we'll be moderating the chat window as well um, and trying to answer some of your questions but because we have five questions we're only going to spend about six to seven minutes per question and at the end we will open up to a full Q&A um, from our audience and um, we will be continuing this conversation in a week and um, through other social media options so thank you for coming and I will now turn this over to our first Moderator, which is James Glapic Roseclag for Q1. Hey everybody, and Una, Una, forgive me. Do you want do you want do you want the video on here? Sure, please. Sure. please okay. Please. Hey everybody, uh, and Una, you didn't you didn't tell me we were going to be claiming ownership over a uh, question. So I just want to be clear that we're putting an open license on the question, right? <laughs> uh, I don't need any attribution. It really should be just public domain. Um, and it. And anyway, I'm really, really thrilled to, 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 to start us off with the, the question of trying to address the question of why should we care about uh, OER degrees or zero textbook cost uh, pathways or however we refer to them. Uh, and there are so many answers. Um, you know, we could really uh, fill the whole, uh, the whole time just, just, just discussing this. And I know I know and I hope others will, will chime in here as well. Um, but I'll, I'll start off sort of at, at, at the, the macro level, and I'd say that we should care about OER degrees if we care about the positive impact of higher education on society generally. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're with uh, the community colleges here. Most of us are with community colleges, and we start off by saying that, you know, community colleges are the great higher education experiment of the 20th century where open education, our open access institutions, right, we succeed by serving the top 100% of students who come to us. Um, it, it, you know, we have uh, oh, nearly 50% of all undergraduate students in the United States, 40% uh, uh, of all first-time freshmen in the United States uh, are in community colleges, roughly 50% of all African-American students, 50% of all Latino students, and so on, are in community colleges. You know, so the impact, the potential impact and the real impact we have is tremendous, but the cost of attending uh, higher education in, in the United States in particular is tremendous. You know, we can, we know, unfortunately, we know that 30% uh, uh, of community college students roughly are hungry. We know that roughly 15% of community college students are homeless on any given day. Uh, so, and, and we know that the cost of student debt in the United States, 1.4 a trillion dollars is just staggering and has incredible societal costs if we think about delayed uh, home ownership, delayed marriage, uh, career choices because you have to pay off the student debt and so on and so forth. So uh, if we believe that higher education uh, is a social good, uh, then it's it, then we do believe also that uh, we want to increase participation in higher education. And because of these, these data that we, I think we all know and that I've pointed out, um, uh, we, we have to reduce the cost, uh, the societal cost of increasing participation and the actual individual cost of participation. Um, uh, there are a lot of initiatives out there across the United States and, 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 and around the world, really, that are trying to do that. 
uh, in the U.S. in community colleges in particular, we have conversations around guided pathways and college promise, making the first couple of years of community college or first couple of years of undergraduate free, uh, and then guided pathways uh, saying that uh, we can do a better job of not only getting students in, but getting them out in a, in a logical, coherent fashion by designing uh, pathways around majors and uh, providing uh, appropriate supports uh, to students. But uh, I think the, the real glue that ties all of this together, these costs, reducing costs, increasing participation, and providing a coherent pathway to students is OER. Uh, you provide the ultimate academic freedom to faculty. Uh, you provide uh, the lowered the lowered costs. You provide a coherent a coherent direction and path to students. Um, so again, I think OER degrees and the use of OER generally, but particularly the degrees are are sort of the glue that ties all of these different concerns together. Uh, with that, uh, I know we're we're limited on time, so I'm going to kick it to I think TJ wanted to uh, participate in in this uh, particular answer as well. Yeah, sure. I'll just. Um say a few words about why, uh, wh why we cared so much about OER degrees at the Hewlett Foundation. You know, the Hewlett Foundation has invested almost $200 million in open educational resources, and a lot of that has been in higher education. But it wasn't until recently, the, the initial focus at Hewlett was on, on uh, big, big name universities in the US, like MIT and Stanford. And, and, and the, the reason behind that was because we wanted to give some validity to the idea of open educational resources and thought that by, by going with these prestigious, you know, well-named universities that there would be, that that would help with that. And I think there, there was something to that. But recently we, re we realized that we needed to shift and focus on how OER can help uh, those who most need that help. Because uh, I'll be honest that the students at MIT are not the students who need uh, OER the most. And so we started looking at what the opportunities might be uh, in community colleges and there were a lot of community colleges already working on this and Una and, and, and the folks at CCC OER and many others um, have been focused on that for quite some time even before Hewlett really got into it. But the idea of an OER degree that could have an impact on students uh, holistically to help them be able to plan from start to finish, uh, know what their costs were going to be for college, number one. And then also the advantages that it would confer to faculty who would be working on a similar project and toward a similar goal. So we had focused on uh, individual faculty and individual courses through the open textbook movement that Hewlett was behind and helping push um, and realized that the time had come that we could, we could push for more institutionalization of OER adoption uh, through OER degrees. And, and, and there were colleges like Tidewater and Nova um, that were leading out on this early. And those models attracted uh, people who were interested in, you know, who had money and who could put some money behind this. And so I think, I think just from a philanthropic perspective and, and why, would, why would you invest in something like OER degrees, maybe that can be helpful to see what the, what the rationale was there. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, this is James. Thanks, TJ. This is James again. Uh, just just one, more, one more perspective from sort of on the ground in, in an institution. Uh, what I found is that uh, ha promoting the degree pathway uh, really gives a rallying cry or a cause to the faculty in a particular discipline. Right? That's, that's what I've been fortunate enough to find in my own institu institution of College of the Canyons. Uh, I, I think that you know some faculty, some departments have gotten so sick of me bragging about all the work that our sociology department has been doing, and, and our CEO bragging about our sociology department, and seeing the press releases, you know, that that they say, hey, I want to get some of that love too, you know, I want to do that for my students too. Uh, it's there's there's this uh, uh, I, I hope well placed uh, uh, competitive nature around around the uh, what doing doing what's in, in the real benefit to the real benefit of students and saying that, you know, my department's making the biggest difference in the lives of our students. I, I hope there's some of that out there. Great. Thank you, um, James and TJ. Um, and um, our audience is participating, but mostly in a, yeah, in a, in a, in a cheering you on. We have a few questions that we will um, take up later at, that are, are um, slightly separate issues. So, Thank you very much. That was a great introduction. And um, 
Now we will go to Q2. Why should my institution focus on OER degrees instead of OER course adoption? And Amanda, this is your question. Sure. So um, one of the things like with BC Campus and with our B BC institutions, we've been really focused on OER course adoption for the last four to five years. And the reason for that initially is because that was a way to really start getting a vested interest within the community and ensuring that people um, knew what open was. We were looking at adoption numbers really, and we were, we were just wanting to sort of get the buy-in slowly but surely across institutions. And we've actually had a significant amount of courses that, um, and faculty who've been adopting that it really became uh, much more evident that what we were looking for is what we wanted to refer to as high impact adoption so the idea is can we do it at scale can we make a significant difference in access to education across British Columbia and also to start making the um, making courses and uh, degrees much more consistent in terms of the way in which they were developing the courses or using the OER. So for example, an institution may want to start focusing on OER degrees because it's, uh, Paul has said this with Paul, um, Paul Stacy said this in the chat, is it is a much more strategic goal in the sense that um, you're not just looking at one off. Like what, for example, what if that one particular instructor no longer teaches that course next year? Um, would that following instructor then take on a faculty role of using the open um, an OER in the course? And so when we start looking at OER degrees, it's about making a change across curriculum, um, making a change um, in teaching and learning practice with faculty from across curriculum, and it's about making a greater impact and actually making a bigger difference for students. So what we're doing is improving the student experience across their entire degree rather than in just one course. Because what we know is that one student may be taking a biology course and then they're, which might be using an open textbook, but perhaps their physics course is not taking or not using an open textbook. And what is the cost of that particular physics book? And what is the, um, what is happening for that student who has to then purchase that particular book or that particular course material? And so if we're able to look at it from a degree perspective, whereby we can ensure that the students are having to pay zero cost uh, in terms of resources for the, the degree, but also an opportunity for faculty to really change the content and the curriculum and the way in which they teach and an opportunity for students to become much more involved either through open pedagogy or open practices or even just a general working knowledge of how Creative Commons works or how open works and what that can bring to them in the future in terms of literacy as well. Um, I'll stop there, but if anybody wants to add on or if you have questions about that I'm happy to chat about or if you want me to expand more I'm happy to thank you Amanda um, yes let's invite in other panelists who might want to share as well um, TJ I wanted to leave you a second so let me just jump in for a minute this is Kim I agree with everything Amanda said, and I also agree with Paul's comment in the, in the chat that there's this kind of strategic focus and emphasis that comes with an OER degree program that's amazing. I just have to say that, you know, I do feel like over maybe the last year that I have sensed that with institutions that we're working with that are doing really good, important work in OER that is not directly on the path towards an OER degree, that we, I start to hear more kind of sense of apology around that, but you know, we're doing good things, but we, we don't have an OER degree program. And I just wanted to just pipe in and say, I think it's amazing to do any work that's moving uh, us towards greater student success. And sometimes an OER degree program can not be the right strategy for an institution. That might be that there's one department that is really challenging or intransigent around this that, you know, can hold up a degree program that, you know, it might, there might be better progress in looking at, at other approaches. And so just, just to call out a couple, I mean, we just, over the last two weeks since classes started at Salt Lake Community College's students in their math courses alone, only math, have saved more than half a million dollars in textbook cost. And they're seeing great success rates and really um, exciting kind of day one engagement in those courses. Um, Cerritos College, 
you know, has worked to really improve outcomes in two of their high enrollment business courses. And over the last year and a half, they've been able to increase the average grade in those courses by three quarters of a letter grade. And there is no difference between the success of Pell eligible and non Pell eligible students. And both of those initiatives could only happen using OER. And both of them are having real impact on students today. And neither one is part of a formal OER degree program right now. And so I, I just, I would say that if, if there are obstacles on campus to doing an OER degree program, that that's, that's, it's one approach and it's a really powerful approach, but it's not the only powerful approach. So I think there are a lot of great ways that we can do OER. For students yeah, just, just give me one minute here. I just was, I was, um, oh. Hi, um, I just wanted to add on to what Kim was saying and I completely, I agree with that and absolutely. And the reason, one of the things I just wanted to share is that while we put out the call for Z creds within our uh, system, it, we sh it is good for us to let you know that there were certain institutions that we were targeting for this because of their um, maturity within open education, their working knowledge, the fact that they had a champion at the institution, the fact that we knew that some of the courses that might be under consideration had already adopted. And so in that sense, those institutions um, were doing already, they were ahead of other institutions across British Columbia. And, and in some cases, as Kim says, you know, we are working with institutions that are smaller with the, across the um, province that are very new to open. And in that case, what we're working with them on is, you know, smaller steps starting at the beginning. So it's just wanted to add that. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Uh, good clarification. And thank you, Kim, for sharing on that. Um, there were some um, great points that were brought up in the chat window. Um, so do definitely take a look at those. Um, and we're going to move on to our next question. And uh, Preston, this is your question. Great, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so, in terms of uh, what longer term changes uh, do we hope OER degrees will bring to our colleges, states, countries, uh, I think that uh, first and foremost, I will say with our institution, and I know that many community colleges in particular uh, face the same challenge, and that is with uh, degree completion. Um, community college students uh, do not complete uh, at a rate nearly as high as four-year institutions. Um, and that's a real emphasis uh, that we have at NOVA and, and many institutions are, are really uh, working hard. And what an OER degree does is it helps to define the pathway for students uh, who actually often need that additional guidance in order to know what is an appropriate course so that they don't uh, take erroneous credits that are going to uh, impact their time to degree uh, and will also help them make sure that they're on a pathway if they plan to continue uh, to a four-year institution uh, to transfer uh, and get uh, credit for the work that they've completed at uh, a community college in particular. Uh, so I think that the, 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 the completion uh, is, is really a major reason why a degree pathway uh, makes a lot of sense, uh, particularly for community colleges, but for any four-year institution or beyond, you know, it, it makes sense to, uh, I, and I think that the, uh, the term uh, that was used earlier by Kim, I believe, was, you know, the strategic planning that uh, is involved with uh, planning a degree program uh, that forethought really does help uh, solve a lot of problems and, and reduce obstacles that you might encounter. Um, but I also think too that uh, we need to remember that you know the idea is to increase access uh, and affordability uh, for our students. Uh, so we want to make sure that we are keeping in mind that students who are worried about putting food on their plate or whether they're going to make rent or other types of uh, really foundational uh, issues related to, to life and survival. 
uh, those things take precedence and they really do impact on students being able to focus and be successful. And, and if we can, in some small way, uh, have uh, a positive impact on their ability to afford to go to school while they are balancing their other responsibilities, uh, just those small uh, incremental um, savings can really add up substantially. Uh, our institution, for example, uh, since 2013, when we started offering our OER program, has saved students over $3 million. Uh, and so that really translates into a lot of small savings over a period of time amongst a large number of students. Uh, and so the impact um, can really snowball in a very positive way. Um, and so we see this as really a, a social justice and equity issue in my mind. I think it provides everyone, particularly those who are uh, at a disadvantage, uh, the additional support and direction uh, and understanding that can hopefully get them past that, that finish line and really make a major difference in their lives, uh, which is going to benefit the community as a whole. So I'll open up to any other comments that folks would like to make. Yeah, this is James, if I may. Uh, I'd also add, that, that's great, President. Absolutely, it, 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 your, your, your comments uh, reflect uh, what we, what we uh, the way we see things here at College Canyon, certainly, and I think throughout the state of California. In addition, I think uh, something that higher education, public higher education really needs to get better at, and that is responsiveness uh, and contextualization for uh, industry. Uh, so uh, leveraging OER uh, in a uh, certificate pathway, maybe not a degree pathway, but a certificate pathway that adds up to a certificate, an industry-based certi certification uh, responding to rapidly evolving and changing needs of business and industry is certainly in the interest of everyone. Uh, uh, our traditional curriculum process uh, is, is quite cumbersome. Uh, and uh, if we uh, uh, are using uh, openly licensed material uh, and, and aligning that, we, if we're using openly licensed material, we can more quickly and more uh, context, in a better contextualized way align that with the needs of business and industry to provide them with uh, uh, graduates who have certifications in their areas. Very good point. Thank you. Alrighty. Um, okay, we will go ahead and move to question four, unless there was anything in the chat window that you wanted to address briefly, uh, Preston. Uh, I, I'm gonna have to come back to that. I, uh, I need to go through and look at a couple of things in the chat window, but I'm certainly happy to come back to some of the comments. Sure, absolutely. Oh, no, this is TJ. <clears throat> there was a question in the chat window about uh, the, the, can you go back to question three again, the impact that OER degrees would ha are having actually on teaching, on faculty practice. Yes. Uh, I, I can't speak to that directly because I'm not at a community college, though I know that there is a belief that this actually does impact uh, faculty practice. And, uh, and Preston, maybe you've seen that at your college and, and James at yours uh, as well. Uh, and it is research that is that we, there is some research happening on that through the Achieving the Dream OER degree initiative that will be looking at what happens to faculty practice uh, when they adopt uh, OER in general, but particularly in the context of an OER degree. So I don't know if either you, James, or Preston can weigh in on that now, or but I sure. do want to say that there is research happening on that, and it's a great question, and it's something that should be attended to. Right. Th thank you uh, for, for pointing that out, and I will just say quickly that. Uh, one of the things that we have really seen is this increased collaboration among faculty, uh, which I think has been very beneficial uh, for our program and for the faculty uh, themselves, because it gives faculty an opportunity to share with their colleagues when they might have a lot of experience developing uh, materials that they are teaching to their own students, but when they're uh, working in this sort of team approach to create a course using open content or, or creating content uh, for a particular course in a team environment, uh, you really get the best 
possible solution uh, when, you know, the, the old saying, um, none of us is as smart as all of us. Uh, we really see that in the way folks are collaborating. And it's not just faculty at our institution in departments, like English faculty collaborating with, with one another or, 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 or things of like that. We see folks sharing among other institutions within our system or other institutions across the country, uh, even you know, internationally, sharing ideas, materials, resources. Uh, and so the whole idea of how you're able to share content, share ideas, uh, that is something that we have seen our faculty embrace. And it's really become something where we designed this planned approach and we've seen faculty sort of take and, and run with it and, and take it to the next level. And, and that is something that I think makes all of us smile um, because that really shows the impact uh, in the buy-in. Thank you, Preston and, and TJ for bringing up that question about teaching quality. Um, it, it really is an excellent one and uh, not one that we directly um, addressed here. So um, I want to now switch to Q4, which has um, really been led into by this discussion. What are the benefits and challenges of sharing um, complete OER degrees with other colleges? And this is a question for Kim Thanos. Thank you, Una. Um, I think I might be like the foremost expert in ways not to do this. And so it's nice to be able to get out in front of it and talk about kind of what we've seen around sharing that's happening well and some of the considerations to think about upfront around this. You know, as I was thinking about the question, I, I really felt like there are almost four levels that need to be addressed upfront in order to support effective sharing. And so um, the first one I would say is very personally at the faculty member le level, there's a question that, that is, am I willing to share? And you know, the reason I say that that's an important one to address up front is we're thinking about institutional programs for OER degrees, is that you know, really often for faculty members, just acknowledging that this is a real question very early in the project and helping faculty members think about that and become conditioned to that idea of sharing out as they, as they move through this work uh, provides an opportunity for a dialogue, provides an opportunity for requests for support and things like that, that, you know, might address that question. Well, you know, alternatively, if we get to the very end of a project, and I'll confess that this was the case with the first OER degree program that we worked on with Tidewater, we really didn't address the question of sharing until we got to the very end of the project and faculty members were caught off guard by it and they felt like they had um, had expectations change on them through the process. The distinction between openly licensing something and actually sharing it out in a way that others can find it and discover it and reuse it you know, those, those are two different things for a faculty member and there are different levels of kind of confidence and support that are required for each of those. So I think that's the first level of sharing or the first question to address. The second question is, am I able to share this? Which all comes down to licensing. And in the Achieving the Dream grant project, this has the most aggressive licensing requirements, thank you TJ, with which we've ever worked. And it's been uh, both just, I think, a real gift in helping do some really important work that has an opportunity to move the field forward quickly because of the ability to share. And it's also been really challenging. And so for the Achieving the Dream OER degree programs, everything used within these degree programs must be openly licensed. So the distinction on that would be if there is a good set of materials for say um, introduction to computer applications or a course like that that is openly available on the internet uh, but is not openly licensed at your institution you might say well an open course just links out to that and acknowledges that it's copyrighted material but that it is um, available. And for this grant, the open licensing of each of the artifacts that's required in the course is actually one of the requirements of the grant. And the benefit of that is that everything that's created within this grant program can be reused 
openly across the community. So I do think that question of, you know, really thinking through from an institutional perspective, what are our goals with our degree program? What licensing would we encourage or if we're providing funding, what licensing would we require? And the questions that come up most often are the, the one that I mentioned before, that is material that's not openly licensed, but is freely available. The second most common question is using library resources, which within an institution can really extend what's available for students to access and use or faculty members to use in the courses. But when it comes to sharing with others, that library collection might not be something that someone at another institution, either in the community or even within a single system might have access to. Um, the third question we see is this very practical, technical question that is, um, can I expose my work? Um, you know, if I'm building everything within kind of native content in Blackboard and I want to share that with someone who is using Canvas or Desire to Learn or sadly worse yet Moodle when it comes to that kind of open sharing, that can be really challenging to do. And so, you know, from a from a very practical perspective early on in the planning of the project, it's great to really think about what are the tools, the platforms, the technology solutions we can use to help faculty members uh, create OER in a way that is easily shared across institutions. And then probably the most challenging is that same question with an added level of complexity, which is, is there a way that I can create work? that I can expose and share with others in a way that provides them full permissions to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute the content. And so, you know, if I'm going to say, well, the way I share out is through a PDF, you know, the revision opportunities and remixing opportunities with the PDF are more challenging. And so, you know, thinking about the 5R component of sharing up front does allow, I will say in all of this, there's never a perfect solution. There are always trade-offs that have to be made, but I think that it allows the, the organizations to think about those trade-offs and make those decisions in a more deliberate way, rather than just getting to the end of a project and kind of running into a wall around, around the sharing that makes it more challenging for that to happen. Any, any other panelists want to weigh in with kind of their questions or experience or comments around that? So, Kim, this is Una. You, you were sharing three levels. Um, did, I must have missed the fourth one. Um. Okay, so the first is, am I willing to share? The mm -hmm. second is, am I able to share due to licensing? Right. The third is, can I expose my work? And then the fourth is, can I expose and enable full 5R permissions in the way that I'm sharing? Got you. Okay, yeah, three and four are kind of related. Uh, that, that's a wonderful summing up. Um, and I'd like to give our other panelists a chance to respond to that if they, if they would like. Um, this is Quill, and I think one of the things when you're considering those four levels and kind of the institutional buy-in to that is part of it. So it's, uh, you know, the institutional attitude and belief and culture around sharing. Um, but it's also the mindset of how can we leverage the best possible experiences for our faculty and students um, using the resources that we have at hand, meaning both open materials, but the materials we have available to us through our institution in a way that that fosters that sharing and actually incentivizes both the sharing and the creation. And I think in a lot of ways, um, the benefits get drowned out by the focus on resources themselves rather than the focus on the actual sharing practice. Um, because that's a harder thing to talk about, but it, it because it's much um, it's cultural. It's much more cultural than I can create a course and that's a thing. It's an artifact. I've created it. It exists. It is very different than I'm changing my perspective on what it means to be a sharing part of a community. Thank you, Quill. I think culture um, does really come into play here. All right, Kim, if you didn't want to address any of the questions in the chat window, I think we'll just move on to our last question and then we'll come around again uh, to, 
to uh, some of the discussions that are happening. Um, some great discussions happening. All right, and whoop, sorry, here we go. And Quill, this is your question. What are the, I'll let you read it because I've got the chat window on top of it, mine. Okay, yes. So, and thank you all for the chat window. I'm having a great time chatting with folks, but I'm gonna talk now. So um, my question is, what are the next steps for OER degrees? And um, I originally thought about this as my responsibility to talk about the future of, of open education degree work. Um, and I kind of got tied up in that. And then I realized that steps are incremental and it's smaller than what is the future of our movement. Um, <laughs> so, um, and I, I'm gonna hit on a lot of the things that have already been spoken about and talked about in the chat window, but um, I really do think that um, the sharing between institutions needs to be bigger and easier and better. Um, and we've already had some discussion both in the chat and amongst people about how to share resources, how to share completed courses. Um, and I wanna add to that conversation that not only do we need, maybe not new databases, because there are lots of places out there where things are shared, but easier to, um, more flexibility and adaption um, and adoption in those resources once they're shared. Um, and there's some great platforms out there, but those things need to grow because it has to be easy for an institution to find a resource, like it, decide to use it, and adopt and adapt it to what the local institution needs and wants. Um, another step for us um, it has really, um, I'm hoping that the research out of the OER degree initiative and the Achieving the Dream project um, will lead to some really great student feedback on what great practice looks like with open education. Um, I, I think that we have an idea from the institutional and faculty perspective. I don't know that we have great information on what inspires students to learn with these resources, what inspires them to interact with them and work with them. Um, and so I'm really excited to hear some of the qualitative feedback that they're starting to get, but I think that our institutions should be collecting and sharing that material, um, that information about what works. Um, I think um, <laughs> there's already a push for the increase um, in materials um, and in courses that support wider institution, wider degree pathways. And I'm thinking in particular about, for example, the career and technical education program that James, um, James College is working at uh, on. I think um, in community colleges, that is a big gift because in a lot of ways, the students in our professional technical areas or career and technical education areas, um, are really more stuck in their educational, um, the materials choices they have because they are produced by industry or because there's very few of them. I'm thinking about some of the, for example, nursing programs that are out there. Um, those materials are very, very expensive and those students are kind of stuck because there is no other place to go even if the faculty wants to go there. Um, and so I'm hoping that we can begin to branch into some of those areas to increase options, um, particularly in whole degree pathways. Um, and I think that in a lot of ways we've started to do some of that work, but it's more intensive work in terms of there's nothing that exists um, that can teach small engine repair. Um, but we need we need people who can do small engine repair. We need to support their time in our institutions in any way possible. Um, and then I'm gonna end on this one because there's a lot of different things that I think we need to think about in terms of sharing our materials and how to work with each other and how to bring about and spark the um, importance of the local educational experience. Because I do think there's a lot to be said for we can be sharing across institutions and everybody writes a comp one class and there's like 17 really good ones out there right now. Um, and we don't need new people to keep making comp one over and over and over again. We need to be adopting and adapting comp one. But I also think that we need to be um, highlighting what it is that makes composition one at Pierce College special and different than composition one at Tacoma Community College, which is you know 12 miles away. Um, and the reason for that is because what we do as teachers is really, really important. 
Um, and we need to be highlighting that, that, um, that significance, that what the teacher brings, what the local institution brings, that culture is necessary and you can preserve that culture while adopting and using other people's materials because I think there's a lot of concern about that um, in the faculty um, space and also in the student space. Um, so, and then I said I was going to end on this, um, and I, this is a big one for institutions that have been doing this work for a while, um, and that is making plans for how to revise and adapt, um, revise and update materials as they're created. Um, I think that that's a step that every institution has to invest in, but I think that maybe we can be thinking about how to invest in it as a wider community so that not every institution is responsible for updating the change in the pre-calc one textbook that we're all using. And I think some fields have adopted that easier than other fields have done. Um, but I think that's some of the effort and work we need to invest in. So um, I'm really, really interested to hear from all the other panelists on this and in terms of time, um, we have a couple of minutes, so I'm curious to see um, if anybody else wants to chime in. Did I miss anything that's a next step? Uh, this is James. I just want to call attention to some, some of the uh, themes from the chat. Uh, Jim and uh, Kim were both uh, with others. We're talking about the uh, need for a, a more strategic and, and considered collaboration between OER degrees and other large initiatives such as Guided Pathways or the College, Prom College Promise uh, initiatives, uh, to name just a few. And then Kelvin has, has shared a lot of really uh, helpful information about uh, competency-based education and the opportunities for uh, alignment between OER degrees and uh, the CBE movement. And I think those, those are yeah, right on, absolutely right on. There was something that came up earlier in the discussion as well around articulation. Um, so most of um, our speakers here are at community colleges or work directly with community colleges, but Amanda Coolidge uh, works with both community colleges and universities. And Amanda, do you want to speak for how obviously articulation has a local context, uh, usually regional? Um, do you anticipate any issues with articulation between your uh, Z degrees at community colleges and your four-year colleges and universities? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, we, I, so the institutions that we're currently working with are actually uh, Kwantlen Polytechnic University, Thompson Rivers University, and then the Justice Institute of BC. I am not entirely sure um, how the courses will transfer over what we're doing our best to, so because we're learning from a lot of lessons learned that especially what we've heard from today um, we're definitely taking notes on this one um, is that when we meet our first initial kickoff meeting is going to be with all of the institutions who will have the Z cred and the idea is to go through all of the courses that are involved with any of the certificates that they're planning to host and identifying where's the overlap. So for example, can this actually be used in your own course? Why are we recreating a first year certificate, or sorry, a first year course in English when perhaps we can reuse one that Lumens created or ATD and how do, can we do that? And then the hope is that basically, um, as one of the things that um, the project manager is interested in doing is as those courses um, become developed is to put them out for peer review from other institutions. So perhaps we may get some feedback from a college or we may get some feedback from an, a university or an institute. And the idea there is to make it a bit more open and transparent in terms of the development, but to also gain feedback. And so when it comes to the articulation committees, um, uh, what we're hoping is that if they are able to easily sort of plug and play the material, then we're hoping that they'll be able to do that with courses. There may be the chance that they will have to change or adapt some of that material. But overall, um, we tend to, we haven't seen a ton of pushback from different articulation committees in terms of using OER or the development of OER. And so if we can get more of a buy-in in terms of seeing the um, the actual progress that's been made and already sort of the collaboration within the upfront stage, we're hoping that that might sort of alleviate some concerns. Great, thank you, Amanda. Other panelists who'd like to share uh, their local context around articulation?
All right. Um, um, so, you know, this is TJ. I'll say, I'll say a word about this because there, I, I mentioned earlier some work that's going on uh, on the global stage, uh, which really has a lot to do with articulation. And you know, some, some of the comments in the chat feed have talked about um, the next steps being uh, institutions sharing with each other and really partnering together to develop uh, degree programs that perhaps cross institutional boundaries. Uh, and, and then when you do that, you really have to pay attention to articulation. So I would recommend uh, you know, people interested in this question should um, look at the work that Wayne McIntosh is doing at the OER Foundation. Uh, it's called the OER University or OER Universitas. Uh, so you can find it on Google. The thing about Wayne is that everything that he's done, every conversation that's ever happened, every meeting that's ever occurred is fully open <laughs> and you can read about it. So if you like to read, you can just read it, the experience that they're having uh, with 50 plus universities from across the world, right? So different institutions in different countries uh, agreeing to contribute individual courses toward an entire degree that then any student in the world could take uh, for free, and then credit would be conferred just through uh, a, an assessment fee. And basically what Wayne and his, his folks are trying to do and have been quite successful in doing is, is getting that articulation agreement. So they've worked through a lot of the challenges. They, they have a lot of experience uh, doing that. There are several institutions in, in North America, a couple in the U.S. that are involved in this as well. So it's just an example uh, and, and a place to learn some lessons about this. But I really think that that's the, where, where OER degrees are headed. And uh, it, it will take some time. Uh, and some of these things will need to be done at the state level because of state laws. And some may be able to cross state boundaries or provincial boundaries. But, but th there is a good example there of people trying to figure this out. And, and it really does come down to articulation and the agreement so that credit can, can count uh, for the students. Thanks for sharing that, um, that, that global uh, picture, um, TJ. And I, I know that California and Virginia have been working on this and New York is working on, on these issues around articulation because they're, they're looking at the whole system um, of public higher ed um, a, around OER. I'm not saying they've solved all of them, but they're actually looking at it. So um, that kind of a vision of looking at it from a, 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 a complete state system perspective is very helpful. Anyone else want to uh, share on that one? All right. Um, I Was there any more um, around guided pathways that came up quite a few times in our chat window and um, there's been some great discussion around that and the relationship with OER degrees and obviously there's a huge overlap there. Um, was there any any other, would anyone like to um, add more about that from our panel? Uh, hi, this is Preston. I can just say really quickly that uh, we are in the process of uh, implementing guided pathways and in doing so are very, uh, having direct con uh, conversations with our, our largest uh, transfer University uh, in our region uh, as a, a real partnership between the two institutions. And so as, as much as uh, our OER degree pathways have been well received and, 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 and have gotten a lot of support, uh, the idea of the completion agenda and partnering with a four-year institution, those formalized guided pathways have really uh, become you know the the main attraction and, and, and the real attention that uh, leadership at our college is, is focused on and I don't think that that necessarily means anything bad or negative for our OER pathways I think it means that what we will see is how our institution is providing uh, pathways for transfer and completion and then how we can incorporate our OER pathways and use the uh, guided pathways to inform additional course development so that the OER courses that we are offering as an institution fit into the guided pathways to completion and to transfer uh, in a seamless way. All 
Right. Thank you. Thank you, Preston, for sharing that those partnerships that are going on and are really powerful. Um, we're just a little over the hour now, and I just want to give each of my panelists a chance to give any closing remarks that they would like. And um, we will just start, um, I think, at the top with uh, James Glapagrosklag, who we started with, and just work our way through. And any closing remarks, James, for this discussion today? Gosh, Una, th well, first of all, uh, thanks to you, Una, and thanks to uh, the Community College Consortium for o Open Educational Resources and the great work that you do bringing us together. Uh, and secondly, uh, what, a, what an honor and, and what fun to be part of this community. It's just, just fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, Amanda, you're up next. Sure, yes, thanks for having me. Um, as you know, we're very new to this, um, to, to starting off with our Zed Cred. So we will be um, following up with some blog posts, sort of lessons learned as we move through and talking about sort of our progress to date. So be sure to check that out. And um, of course, it'll be great to reach out to all of you as well to um, get more suggestions and feedback as we go on. So we're always looking to share and collaborate. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda, for joining us. I, I've heard you guys up in British Columbia say this before, that you, you had a late start and you, you have a way of catching up and uh, taking the lead. So I'm excited to see what you guys come up with. Uh, Preston, you're up next. Hey, I, I, I just want to say thank you. I, I have learned a great deal from being able to participate in this session with, with such a great group of, of presenters as well as audience members and the conversation in the chat has been fantastic. Uh, and I really think that we have uh, an opportunity to continue this conversation and, and really uh, gain some momentum. And I know that I'm not only speaking for myself when I say that those of us uh, at CCCOER uh, are more than happy to offer assistance to others um, to, to help. So uh, again, thank you all for participating today. Thank you, Preston. Um... And, and absolutely, um, Preston is on our board and um, we, we're open to questions and helping others at all times. And Kim Thanos, thank you so much for coming today. Kim, closing remarks? Oh, just a thank you as well. I completely agree with Preston. It's so fun to have a chance to interact and get different ideas and perspectives and appreciate the chance to do that. Thank you. Thank you. And Quill, I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, to uh, close out our uh, discussion panel. Um, can I say ditto to what everybody else said? <laughs> um, thank you again for the opportunity to participate, but also thank you for all of your wonderful comments in the chat window. I think we had a really good discussion happening there, and um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to learn from everybody. Um, and I will just say, please join our community of practice. You're looking at a slide about CCCOER. Um, and we do have a website, cccoer.org, right? Um, please join us there um, when, if you would like more information about our organization. Perfect. Thank you all for coming. Um, and a thank you so much to our amazing panelists. And we are looking forward to seeing you in the coming months at uh, more of our online activities. And of course, for those of you who are going out to uh, California in October, we look forward to seeing you there as well. Uh, thank you and have a great afternoon. Uh, one more thing, don't forget about the year of open. It's still ongoing. Absolutely.